Good morning and welcome. Uh, those of you here in the room with us and those of you joining us online, it's good that we can come together this morning. I'm Steve Landheis. Uh, on behalf of the rest of the team here, uh, it's good. Hear these words from Psalms. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Those who seek the Lord lack nothing. Hmm. Things that make you go, hmm. Uh, will you stand and join us in, in song? Dear Father, we just want to thank you for this amazing day where we can just come and lift up your name with song and praise. Father, you just show us so much love each and every day, and we just can't thank you enough for that. Um, we pray that you will be with Pastor Jacob as he brings us your message today and just open up our hearts and our minds to what he has to say. Lord, there's so much going on in this world today, and sometimes we just can't find the words to say exactly how we feel. Father, just pray that as we leave this place today, just help us to find that quiet place where we can just let you hear what's in our hearts. In your most precious name, amen. Streams of grace flow deep and wide. 
slowing down At the cross, at the cross I surrender my life I'm in awe of you I'm in awe of you Where your love ran red And my sin washed white I owe all to you the 
goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I That's a good one. You may be seated.
Just a few pictures from Wednesday night of VBS um, this week. If you've noticed, that uh, we have two tables up here. We have a sign that says girls' food table and a sign over here that says boys' food table. So if you haven't been here in the last few weeks, we are doing a competition during the month of VBS. And so we're encouraging our VBS families to be able to bring in food um, and they get to choose whether they want to contribute to the girls' table or the boys' table. If you come up here and see our, our uh, gas station, that's what that is, right? Fuel pump, gas station. Girls have 199 um, items of food, and the boys only have 66. So I don't know if that is more like more girls have been giving or if more people just want to see Kent lose and have the pie in his face. So, remember our two captains of Sarah Harms and, uh, and Ken Whitmore, and uh, just, yeah, like, it's just a good time to be able to bring that. If you, as a congregation, would like to join in on that as well, there are two wagons out by the welcome table, and uh, one is labeled girls and one is labeled boys, and you can contribute to that. Again, you don't have to be a girl or a boy. You could be for, against Kent. I keep using that. Um, <laughs> Or if you want to see Sarah to lose, or if maybe if you just want them to tie, that'd be awesome as well. So you can figure this out. Um, again, just an awesome time to um, use something like this, a community outreach, community VBS. Um, I think we, uh, Connie, do you remember how many kids again this week? Yep, six more registered, close to 50 kids in the community. Um, just an awesome time, again, just to be able to invite the community in. Many parents have been staying, been uh, building relationships, and just, again, having a lot of fun if you can't see from the, uh, from the video or from the pictures. And if you want to join in on the fun, feel free to come and hang out uh, with that as well. Uh, before we dive into Scripture and everything, I would like to actually read a story. Because we're going through this uh, sermon series, VBS, that each week it's talking about how God provides. And today we're focusing on, give us, Lord, our daily bread. Now, we're not going to preach on the, the Lord's Supper, the Bible's Lord's Supper, the Lord's Prayer. Uh, but the passage that we focused on in our VBS group is the story of oil and flour from 1 Kings verse 17, where this widow was given just enough. And often in our culture, there's, there's not much, I'm not saying everybody, but there's not much food insecurity that the majority feels. Now we know, obviously, while we're uh, collecting food for the food bank, that that is a real need, especially in our community. But I want to read you a story. Fred and Cheryl went to Haiti 25 years ago to pick up a child that they had adopted. Addie was five years old. Her parents had been killed in a traffic accident that left her without a family. So that evening, after they get back home, that evening back home in Arizona, they sat down to their first supper together with their new daughter. There was a platter of pork chops and a bowl of mashed potatoes on the table. After the first serving, the two teenage boys that they also had kept refilling their plates. Soon the pork chops had disappeared and the potatoes were gone. Addie had never seen so much food on one table in her whole life. Her eyes were big as she watched her new brothers, Thatcher and Graham, satisfy their ravenous teenage appetites. Fred and Cheryl noticed that Addie had become very quiet and realized that something was wrong. Maybe she was agitated, bewildered, maybe there's some insecurity. Cheryl guessed that it was the disappearing food. She suspected that because Addie had grown up hungry. When food was gone from the table, she might be thinking that it would be a day or more before there was more to eat. Cheryl had guessed right. She took Addie's hand and led her to the bread drawer and pulled it out, showing her the back, back up three loaves that they had. She took her to the refrigerator, opened the door, and showed her the bottles of milk and orange juice, the fresh vegetables, jars of jelly and jam, and peanut butter a carton of eggs, and a package of bacon. She took her to the pantry with its bins of potatoes, onions, squash, and the shelves of canned goods, tomatoes, and peaches, and pickles. She opened the freezer and showed Addie three or four chickens, a few packages of fish, and two cartons of ice cream. 
All the time that she was reassuring, or all the time she was reassuring Addie that there was lots of food in the house, no matter how much Thatcher and Graham ate, and how fast they ate it. There was a lot more where that came from. She would never go hungry again. And Cheryl didn't just tell her that she would never go hungry again. She showed her what was in those drawers and behind the doors, named the meats and the vegetables, placed them in her hands. It was enough. Food was there. Whether she could see it or not, her brothers were no longer rivals at the table. She was home. She wouldn't go hungry again. In a world like this, what does it mean to pray, give us this day our daily bread? We're going to read a story about a widow who, who didn't have enough, who worried about having enough. Let us pray before we dive into Scripture this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the Spirit who draws us in. The Spirit who brings us here is this, in this place, whether physically within these, in this building as your church or with those who worship with us online or those who are just out celebrating this day that you've made. God, we praise you for this church. We praise you for this church family. God, we ask that you open up our hearts and our minds to your word. Let the Spirit be active in our, in our lives that we can hear your voice. God, we pray this in your name. Amen. So our passage today is from 1 Kings, verse 17, or not verse 17, chapter 17, verses 8 through 16. So if you want to pull that out in your Bibles, um, phones, however you have your Bible with you, it also will be on screen. Maybe you just want to listen. One, one of the beauties about the Old Testament, a lot of story. And so you can just listen. Feel free to close your eyes with that. Don't fall asleep. But... You can hear the word of the Lord from 1 Kings 17. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home to make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Again, we talk about food insecurity. What would it be like to say, sorry, I have just enough to feed myself and my child? And then doesn't, she doesn't end there. She says, I have just enough to feed us, and then we'll die. So it wasn't really even enough to sustain or to keep them alive or maybe just wait for the next time that they can find some provision. Like This was the end. I'm giving a little context. There was a great famine in the land. Also know that this is enemy land. So Elijah, being in a safer place, would say, hey, go to this enemy land. Go find a widow. So go find a, the, one of the poorest people in this foreign land, and I will have them provide for you. If I was Elijah, I'd be like, God, what are you doing? 
Like, yes, you've done things before, but I don't want to do this. I don't want to go there. But Elijah gets up and he goes. Again, remember, enemy land. And this enemy land was known for buying their food from Israel. So if the whole country was buying their food from Israel, God's promise later on was like there would be food for everybody until rain hit the land. So a drought, famine, they're not producing any food at this moment. So they're buying all their food. A widow and their child, they're not getting any of that. They don't have sources of income. They're dependent on charity. There's no way for them to be self-sustaining, to just work a little harder and they can do it. It doesn't work that way here. So that's the context. And Elijah says, hey, would you give me a drink? Now she's getting ready to leave to do that. Hey, and can I have a piece of bread? Which doesn't seem like a lot. It doesn't seem like a big ask, but when you have nothing, isn't anything a big ask? Maybe it's an apple. Maybe it's a dollar for the apple at the store. Is that even adequate anymore? You buy an apple for a dollar? Let's say it is. If you have no money, it might as well be a million dollars, right? If you can't afford it, it doesn't matter. Again, this is the context in which they're in. And so then Elijah approaches her and says, go, go do what you just said, but first make me a small loaf. Go make me a small loaf. Now, I know that we have many saints here, but how many of you would choose to bake a small loaf of bread for a stranger when you know that you and your child are dying? But first, make me a small loaf. Now, we can look in, in Scripture and we can find little clues when he asks for a piece of bread, she replies to him, as surely as the Lord your God lives. As surely as the Lord your God. So she's not a believer. She knows who kind of Elijah is. Probably knew he was a Hebrew, knew he was of the Israelite nation, and just said, the Lord your God. And Elijah's there saying, but first, again, make a small loaf. For this is what the Lord the God of Israel says the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day of the Lord sends rain on the land. Who is she supposed to trust when she doesn't believe in his God? Is that even a valid point for her? If she doesn't believe in God, maybe she's heard stories of the Israelite nation. Of course she's heard stories. Israel back then did amazing things with God. But if she did not believe, there's no authority with Elijah's words. But yet, it seems like she's just desperate enough to try something, right? Try something different, try something new. Elijah stays with her, she makes bread. The jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Pretty short, simple story. Are we mad at God for often giving us just what we need? When it's just enough? Like we pray for... Farmers are praying for rain, but what if it only rains a tenth of an inch? I think they're happy. Now, I can't speak for every farmer out there. I can't speak for every individual. Do 
Can we praise God for even when the blessings seem to be small? Unlike where our story, they were able to go to the pantry, to the, the freezer, to the fridge, and look at all the drawers and say, look how much food we have. This woman was given just enough. Just enough so that the jar did not run dry and that the jug did not go empty. I think I flipped those wrong. Are we mad at God, though, when he gives us just enough? Do we really mean it when we say, give us this day our daily bread? Or, or should we rephrase it and say, Lord, give us this day our yearly bread? We want a supply. We want not to have to pray to you every day for this. We want just the abundance so that we know, we can see that there is extra, that there is enough, that if I want more, I can have it. Do we actually mean what we pray? Maybe you don't pray it. I would encourage you to. Give us this day our daily bread. So, the Israelites during this time. Last week we talked about the manna and the quail. When the Israelites went into the promised land, the manna and the quails, they stopped showing up. But oftentimes when God seems to be constant and we keep um, understanding where he's showing up and it seems like a pattern, a routine, I feel like God shakes it up a little bit. He says, nope, you've come too dependent on here. Like you're going to have to build up that faith again. There's a long time that they had just the man and the quail. And again, it'd been, uh, we had, they had grown accustomed to it. An author wrote, I got it as an anonymous quote, so I don't know who wrote it, but it says, because of our proneness to look at the bucket and forget the fountain, God has, frequent, has frequently changed his means to supply to keep our eyes fixed on the source. Again, do we focus on when God gives us just a little and we complain or we're bitter? Or we're like, God, you can give us anything we want, and yet you give such a small amount. Do we get mad at the provision God gives us because we don't think it's enough? Or do we trust in him and what he has given? We live in a world built around having more. I don't know about you, but remember me and Mallory were on a, on a road trip and one of the best things to eat on a road trip, I think, are the potato lays from Taco John's. I hate eating tacos on, in the car. That's awful. But eating the potato lays and you get the nacho cheese, they fit perfectly in your cup holders. But something about that, just on a road trip, it's just, I think they're better than fries on a road trip like that. But we went to Taco John's. And we got some tacos, too. I made a mess. But we had the potato lays, and I ordered a large pop. And I kid you not, I, had, I couldn't find the picture for today. But I stuck my fingers like this. It was on the table, and it went up to here. There was so much. You go to other countries around the world, and our smalls are their largest. But we live in a country that more is better. I grew up in a Dutch family, and more was better. More bang for your buck. All you could eat buffet was the best thing ever. My grandma would go and then take leftovers home. <laughs> Sorry if you do that. More was always better. And I will admit that there are things that, yes, that is true. The more we talk with God, the more we grow in relationship with him, the more we know about him, the more we feel his presence. Yes, those can be good things. The more we dive into the word, yes, those are good things. But do we pray, for God, like pray to God, hey, just give us more? Or do we look to God to provide 
And that's hard. When our world around us tells us that no, more is better. What does it take to be satisfied with God? Last week we coined the term, we often have become spiritually hangry. We know that what it is to not have maybe food in our stomachs for a few hours and we get hangry, we get argumentative, we're ready to eat, but spiritually hangry. Again, give us this day our daily bread is not just for physical bread, but it's also for Jesus. Do we understand that he nourishes us, that he fulfills us? And that so often in our world when we feel so unsatisfied that we push ourselves, maybe it's that next career move, maybe it's the next pay raise, maybe it's just the next uh, toy, a boat, a car, camper, or you name it. I don't know what are toys anymore. (laughs) All my toys are for little kids right now. (laughs) Our world tells us just get that next thing and you'll be happy. Get that next thing and you'll be satisfied. And what does it mean to be satisfied in the Lord? I got another story. I think it flows well. Immediately after World War II, the Allied armies gathered up many hungry and homeless children and placed them in large camps. There were children who were there. The children were abundantly fed and cared for. However, at night, they did not sleep well. They seemed restless and afraid. Finally, a psychologist hit on a solution. After the children were put to bed, they each received a slice of bread to hold. If they wanted more to eat, more was provided. But this particular slice of bread was not to be eaten. It was to just be held. The slice of bread produced marvelous results. The children would go to sleep subconsciously feeling it, that they would have something to eat tomorrow. That assurance gave the children a calm and restful night. There was always plenty to eat, but yet they went to bed scared and afraid. There was always enough. So they gave them a piece of bread. And and if they ate it, they got more. There was always more. But this, they always had to sleep with a piece of bread. So that they knew that there was always going to be something for tomorrow. I think of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Makes me lie down in green pastures, leads me to still waters. Maybe you have that memorized, maybe you don't. It's a good one. I always bring it up, though. I, I seldom preach on this passage because I like to bring it up a lot. But the whole thing about being, she- or being sheep, we're sheep. Jesus is our great shepherd. He leads us to the still waters. He brings us to the pastures. He lets us lie down and be restful. But the thing is, sheep are stupid animals. I bring this up every time. Maybe this is a broken record for you. Sheep are stupid But there's things about sheep. They will not lie down and go to bed unless they are well fed, unless they know that they are safe, unless they know that the sheep, the stupid sheep next to them is their friend, that there's no quarrel going on, that they're not invading their space. Sheep have to feel like like a sense of home, of comfort of satisfaction before they'll rest. So what keeps you up at night? Do you feel a restlessness? Do you feel like you can't sleep? Are we just thinking about the next day and what we can get to acquire more? Or are you trying to find a place where you feel satisfied? Do we actually mean it when we say, Lord, give us this day our daily bread? Can we be like the widow where we may be just getting enough and yet praise God for it? Not saying, God, we wish the jar was completely full and we wish the jug was overflowing. 
what we're told. Okay, so the two questions I ask. us about God. What did this message tell us about God? God is faithful. God's enough. God is faithful. He asks us to give back. Yeah, the widow didn't just keep it all to herself. I think that leads well into the next question. No one take that answer. She already gave it. Leads to the next question. How does this help us live tomorrow? Thankful for what we already have. Trust God. The adequacy of God's provision. What does this mean for Wednesday night for VBS? Practice. Practice. Thanks, Cody. (laughs) That's what we think about. We don't just sit up here like, these are fancy questions. What does it tell us about God and what, how do we live out this tomorrow is really just how do we seek God, how do we share with others and serve God in the places that he has placed us. If we don't focus on those things at the end of this, at the end of our Bible readings, when we talk with God, and this is just a lecture These are words of life for people. God is enough. God has given enough. God is faithful in his love for us. He doesn't just bless us so that we can hoard them to ourselves so that we can bless other people. Isn't that the good news? Sharing God's blessing with the world around us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this story. We thank you for the story of Elijah to be sent to a foreign land, an enemy land, a land that was barren, a land that was plagued by drought, a land that was in need of both physical rain, had physical thirst, but they had spiritual thirst as well. God, we thank you for the story of Elijah going God, we also pray that we are a church, that we hear your call, and that we too will go. We know that there is much thirst in our community around us. We know that there's much thirst in the community in which is in this building or online with us. God, we pray that we are a people that that we see with your eyes. That we see where you're leading that we also see what you have given. So oftentimes we want to be assured of, of success. We want to be assured of victory. We want to be assured that everything's going to be all right. But God, let us focus on you and know that you are a provider, that you provide for us in, in a, a variety of ways. And when you provide for us, that it's always enough. So God, we thank you. God, we thank you for this space, for the the walls around us, but also that your spirit unites us as a church body with those who are here, those who are in our community as well, those who may be worshiping, and where you see those opportunities for restoration for grace. God, as we pray for our world and those around us in our community, we also pray for our church family. We know that there's been a few instances of COVID. We pray for those who've been affected. We pray for healing. We pray for safety for those around us. 
if anyone was exposed, we pray for those who have uh, other illnesses, other diseases that they're going through. Pray for other healing. God, we know that there are even more of the answers that we're looking for. that provision may be, and we pray that we pray. God, we come to and to pray in your name. Amen. So at this moment, I'm going to invite um, our missionary speaker, Bob Bain, comes to us from Bahrain. I probably don't say that correctly, but that's how I was say it a little bit like that. But um, comes to us um, from the Middle East, one of our missionaries that we support, and just a good time to be able to uh, have have you here and get to tell us a little bit about the ministry that's going on. And uh, yeah, whatever you like to share with us, we're all right. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you. Uh, it's just uh, a gift for me to be together with you, and uh, a question, if I were to put a, a map of the world uh, before you right now and ask you to identify the kingdom of Bahrain, how many of you could, could do that? Okay, I see a handful of people who could uh, find the kingdom of Bahrain. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Bahrain, Bahrain is in the Middle East. It's right off the coast of Saudi Arabia. It's in the Persian Gulf. In that part of the world, it's more often referred to as the Arabian Gulf because the Persian uh, connection is with Iran, and uh, people in that part of the world don't like Iran very much, so they don't call it the Persian Gulf. They call it the Arabian Gulf. Uh, it's in a part of the world that's really, really hot. Uh, we're grateful to be home this time of the year because in Bahrain right now it's about 120 degrees, and at night it cools off to uh, a, a nice, comfortable 94 or so. Uh, the Arabian Gulf in the summer averages about 93 degrees, the temperature of the water. So uh, just gives you a sense of how inhospitable it is uh, in that part of the world. Now, if you'll indulge me this morning, I'd like to teach you a little Arabic. How many of you know Arabic? It's not a very common language, if you maybe know a little. Uh, the first word I'm going to ask you to repeat is the word salam. So can you say salam? The second word is Kramer and his wife. You'll see a picture of those two. Uh, decided that they were being called by God after graduating from New Brunswick Seminary to go to the Arab world to preach the gospel. Now, they went to uh, RCA Global Missions to, to pitch this sense of being called by God, and basically the RCA mission board said, we don't think so. We don't think it's a good use of resources to go to the Arab world because Muslims, they just don't seem to want to embrace Christianity, so we're not going to support you. Samuel and Amy Zwamer and trusted God. They raised money on their own. They went to uh, the Arab world, and they ended up landing in Bahrain again in the year 1893. There they began three works in ministry. They began a church. They began a small school. Uh, Amy realized early on that Muslim girls were not able to go to school, so she started a small school called the Acorn School, and they started a small clinic. Today, those three ministries thrive. The first ministry, the church, which was started by Samuel Zwamer, is now the National Evangelical Church, is comprised to be able to worship together. Is there an English congregation? There is a Pino congregation, and there is a Korean congregation. Now, I want you to understand this. In the Arab world, where many people think there's nothing but terrorists and hostility, Upwards of 5,000 people are worshiping together, uh, praising the risen Christ on a typical weekend. This all began in the late 1800s, and it was so fruitful that when uh, Samuel and Amy Zwamer went back to the RCA Mission Board a little bit later, they decided to take them on as missionaries. And now Samuel and Amy Zwamer are considered the preeminent missionaries to the Middle East that have ever been. And this is a part of our story. 
This is a part of the RCA history that most people don't know. Uh, a place where many people think the Christian faith can't take hold, it's, it's really showing great fruit. And you'll see here, not only did the church thrive, but the school, which Amy Zwamer started, is now called El Raja. That is an Arabic uh, phrase that means hope. My wife, my son, and a daughter-in-law who recently married decided to come to Bahrain and to serve there. They all teach uh, at the El Raja school. And 98% of the students are Sunni Muslims. And every day they're being exposed to the truth of God's word. The, uh, the, the faculty is half Muslim, half Christian, and it's a unique undertaking. Uh, but uh, every day the students there are exposed to the teaching of the gospel. And then the third part of the mission outreach there is the clinic, which was started by Samuel Zwamer today. That clinic is the American Mission Hospital. It has five campuses, and it is in the process of building the fifth campus, which uh, the king of Bahrain is uh, choosing to underwrite almost in its entirety. Now, why would the king of a Muslim nation choose to underwrite the cost of a Christian hospital? It's an important part of the narrative. You may not know, but Bahrain was the first country in the Middle East to discover oil. It happened in uh, 1932. Now, you remember that Samuel and Amy Zwamer came together with others to Bahrain in the late 1800s. And so part of the narrative in Bahrain is that the RCA, these Christians, cared for us before we had anything of value. And they've never forgotten that. And so the king, when this fifth campus was uh, conceived, uh, shared that he would not only give the land, but he gave $45 million to build the hospital. So this is what your uh, money and prayer are helping to enable. And uh, I just would want you to feel a sense of great delight in this, a sense of hope and a future. We hear so many stories today of the church struggling, the church just, you know, trying to find its way in the 21st century. Uh, but in the Middle East, certainly the Christian faith is not the predominant faith, uh, but it is growing. And uh, I just did a confirmation class, and uh, I'll tell you more about this if you choose to stay afterward, but one of the uh, participants in the class, I never saw his face. Uh, he, he chose to join the class over Zoom, and uh, he did that because he's a Muslim. Uh, but he has now become a believer in Jesus. And uh, he wants to be baptized, but he says, you know, Pastor, I can't bring shame on my family. I love my family. I don't want to uh, hurt them in any way. So is it possible for me to be baptized somewhere other than Bahrain? Because if I'm baptized here, my family will learn of this. You know, no harm will come to me, but it will bring shame to my family. And so can you help me be baptized elsewhere? Uh, every time we have a worship service, we probably have a half a dozen people that come in full uh, Muslim dress because they're curious about the gospel. And uh, this is the ministry that you're helping to, uh, uh, to support. And so I want to say shukran, which again is thank you. And if you'd like to know more about the ministry, I believe we're going to have a, a, a time of fellowship and questions following the service. So again, thank you. We, we thank you um, again for the work. The work um, that was started, was initiated long before we were here. And God, we know that your work will continue long after we're gone. And, and we thank you for just the opportunities to, to partner um, with all sorts of people. Um, but today we just want to thank you for the, the partnership um, that we have with, uh, with Blaine, for him to be able to come here and, and celebrate with us just the work that's been going on, um, the, the, again, the cool things, the unfathomable things, the things that um, our media doesn't actually tell us, that, that there are places where Christians and Muslims can work together um, in various ways, that the gospel is not, um, not falling on deaf ears. God, we know that you are at work. We know that you are... Um, that you are doing amazing things. Um, and God, we just, again, praise you for that. We continue to pray for 
um, Blaine and his family and just uh, their travels around the United States to be able to give other updates to supporting churches. We thank you for his ministry um, that they're doing and that his family has bought into that as well. Um, working at the school, God, we thank you again for, for the willingness of their families, the willingness of um, all your servants who are working over there. And God, we just pray that, that you give them strength, you give them courage, and that uh, you give them just the, the peace that only you can give in all their time. Amen. I forget. What am I doing? Am I doing announcements now? Cool. So that happens when you change things up on me in the morning. Cool. Just a few announcements. Is that, uh, again, remember VBS. It's not too late if you have an individual in mind um, and they want to come to VBS or you want to hand out a flyer. I think, are the registration forms still out? Or Yeah, registration forms are still out. Um, would love to be able to invite others into that as well. Um, again, we ask that if you would, uh, would like to partner with us during the mission of VBS um, to do that as well. And uh, for the sides, um, oh, I'm going to invite Bob up too real quick for another short announcement. Um, but uh, again, also just if you would like to partner with us in mission in any way, we have the blue mailbox in the back. It's titled Mission Mail. Um, again, you can fill out connection cards, volunteer um, cards for that as well, or uh, that's where your offerings can go if you'd like to partner with us financially. Um, but I'm going to give it to Bob real quick for a quick announcement. Thank you. Good morning. For those of you who don't, don't know me, I'm Bob Snyder, and I'm a co-chair of Outreach. Um, we have a little bit of an outreach opportunity uh, that we have in front of us as a church. So our, for those of you that know on our Days that we have communion, we have a special offering plate that goes to the Deacon's Fund. Deacon's Fund is used to help support those in our community that are in need. And the Deacon's Fund at this point in time has been depleted, so we are unable to help um, through that Deacon's Fund at this point in time. So next Sunday, uh, July 24th, we will have a special offering to try and refill that Deacon's Fund. So if you feel so led uh, to perfectly consider that over the next week, we would just ask that you do that, and um, we'll be passing the plate uh, next Sunday morning. So just be in prayer for that this week. With that, would you please stand? Again, we're a little different than normal, but I'm going to give the benediction, and we'll close with a closing song. Hear God's parting blessing to you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and grant you his peace. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now.